Yeah, so today's uh, seminar speaker is uh, Professor Ricardo Martinez Garcia, um, who is a longtime collaborator of mine. Um, Ricardo and I started working together back when he was a, a PhD student. Um, he was conveniently located then uh, at uh, the university in Palma de Mallorca, Spain. So I had good reasons to go and go to Mallorca uh, back then, which was nice. And um, yeah, over the years, we've worked on a number of themes together, um, some related to uh, pattern formation in arid and semi-arid systems, and some related to uh, animal movement and search processes. But he's also done a whole lot more uh, work than, than uh, on different themes as well. And his talk today will give you a, a broader perspective of the range of things he's done focusing on uh, pattern formation and self-organized uh, systems in biology. So uh, he, as I mentioned, he did his uh, PhD in the um, uh, interdisciplinary physics group uh, uh, from the University in Palma. And then he went on to do uh, a postdoc with a mathematician named Corina Tarnita and also uh, Simon Levin uh, at Princeton University. Um, if you're familiar with mathematical biology, you know that Simon Levin is like the godfather of mathematical biology. So that was uh, significant that Ricardo was able to be there uh, and, and to work with uh, 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 folks of that caliber. Um, and he still talks to me, so that's, that's, that's nice even after all that. Um, but since then, uh, for the past two years, he's been in Brazil, uh, in Sao Paulo, uh, where he is, and I'm going to have to read this because I never remember the title and all the acronyms. He is now the Simons F A P E S P, Assistant Professor in Biological Physics at the ICTP South American Institute for Fundamental Research, which, uh, as I understand it, has uh, it, in many ways a sort of similar uh, focus and mission as, as CASAS, so sort of a, a kindred spirit there. So again, thank you, Ricardo, and uh, very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Justin, for a very nice introduction, also for the invitation. And thank you all for uh, making the time to, to be here today. It's a really great pleasure. Although this time has to be virtual, I really hope to be able to visit you uh, physically soon. So yeah, as, as Justin said, I'm going to be uh, talking about um, self-organized patterns in biology. I'm going to, to talk about them broadly. And I'm going to structure the discussion in a way that I give you this broad overlook, overview. So hopefully I, I can interact with as many as you as possible and I can reach as many interests uh, in common with you. And then we can keep the discussion if, if you want. So uh, maybe I should start sharing my screen. Uh, that will help. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to mute here. Okay. Great. So now you can see my screen. Um, so, so I was, as I was saying, I'm going to be talking about self-organization, and self-organization is a a very broad term, I would say. Especially if you come from physics, if you come from biology, it has very different uh, nuances. And the way I'm going to be thinking about self-organization today is by this spontaneous emergence of system level order that I'm going to call patterns to these order structures out of individual level interactions. So this is a still a very broad definition. Um, but if you want to be more precise with examples, more concrete, uh, we have examples of this kind of self-organized systems in very different scales in biology and with systems that have very different properties. So for instance, in the smallest scale, we have this uh, kind of active aggregation of cells that happens in, in some organisms. I'm going to touch a little bit on those uh, later. Uh, we also have on larger scales these bird flocks that probably some of you have already seen through your windows or in these very nice uh, movies. Uh, if we turn to systems that do not move, for instance, to sessile organisms, we do have these patterns as well. For instance, in microbial systems, biofilm development is one example that has very important uh, health implications. I'm going to discuss this a little bit as well in, 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 the, in the second part of, of the talk. And on larger scales, for instance, we have a coral colony in the oceans. Uh, if we continue scaling up to larger systems, we even find these patterns that cover 
hundreds of kilometers, sometimes even continental scales in these examples of landscape patterns that can be, for instance, uh, mussel beds that are in the, in the northern sea, so kind of close from where you are, or in semi-arid ecosystems, these uh, vegetation patterns that cover hundreds of, of kilometers. So of course, all these systems are very different from each other. And I'm not going to claim in any way that they are uh, similar or, or something like that, although I will try to be a little bit uh, thought provoking in, in, a few, in a few slides. But there is something that, that does put all these systems together. And it is that when they create this, this order, when they create these patterns, they also, um, the, the, the emergence of these patterns also leads to the uh, emergence of new properties in the system, of new behaviors in the system that we cannot understand just by understanding the interacting units uh, very carefully. So there is no way for us to understand the ecological or the biological significance, for instance, of a bird flock if we understand very well how birds operate. So this is, these, these behaviors are called emergent behaviors and are one of the paradigms, paradigms of, of complex systems and, 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 and one of the, the, the behaviors that I'm going to, to discuss more in depth today. So this emergence of, of new behaviors is going to lead to two questions that are fundamental to understand these self-organized systems that are also going to drive um, my discussion today and the projects that I want to, to present to, to you today. So, the first question um, is, of course, related to the causes of this of these structures. So, how are these in interacting units uh, behaving? How are they interacting with each other in a way that creates this pattern? The second the second question is more related to the why, if you want to to understanding what are the consequences of these emergent uh, behaviors. So, what are the consequences at larger time scales, for instance, on that ecological time scale or even at an evolutionary time scale, of the formation of these patterns? So these two questions, uh, of course, are going to be fine-tuned depending on the system that we study. Uh, but one of the, of the systems where people started asking them uh, before or, or earlier was, uh, was this the vegetation patterns. So uh, vegetation patterns are these structures that are appearing uh, now in your, in your screens uh, that emerge in regions of, of the earth in which water is, 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 is scarce. There is no so much water for plants to grow. And in response to this uh, lack of water, uh, vegetation arranges itself in, in these in this kind of, of structures. So as you can see um, in, the, in the screen already, uh, they, they, they appear on very different regions. Here I'm just showing some examples in Israel, in Africa, and in Australia. They have very different scales that, of course, are going to depend on vegetation species, are going to depend on the properties of the landscape. But regardless of all these details, um, the shape of these patterns can be classified broadly in three categories. These categories are uh, these kind of labyrinthic uh, patterns that you have now uh, here in the screen. Um, spot patterns, like the one that I'm showing you here in Zambia, or these gap patterns, as the one that you can see here in Australia, that in this case has a very specific name that is called fairy cycles because of some legend behind their origin and, and, and the, the way people living in these regions uh, thought they were forming. So for those of you that are more familiar with, with physics or even with developmental biology, these patterns are probably triggering something in your mind because they are very similar to uh, the, the, the kind of patterns that Turing was uh, getting out of his theory back in the 50s, last century. And actually, the first people that started thinking about these uh, structures were physicists and mathematicians, and were precisely because of that, because they were making this link between the theory that they knew and this new example of patterns that they were seeing in, in aerial images of, of the Earth. So the, 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 the Turing uh, activation inhibition mechanism to explain pattern formation is probably very familiar to, um, to many physicists, uh, to those of you that are physicists. But for those of you that are not so familiar, I'm, I'm going to, to give you a very brief overview of how these models operate based on this activation inhibition uh, principle. So basically, these early models, and I want to make it clear that these are early models. Of course, the field has exploded since then, and now there are more sophisticated approaches that take into account many other things and, and are much more uh, rich in behavior, but also complex in math. Uh, they are based basically in two partial differential equations that are coupled with each other. One of these PDEs is representing the, uh, the it's, it's describing, sorry, the dynamics of, of water in space and time. It would, would be the, the blue one here. And the second PDE uh, describes the uh, dynamics of vegetation, okay? 
So as I said, these two PDs are coupled with each other and they are coupled through this term here that you can see that basically represents the infiltration of water and its conversion into vegetation biomass. And then of course, there are other mechanisms that these models account for. Uh, they have some uh, external input of water that is this R parameter here, some physical loss of water that for instance, could represent water evaporation, but also infiltration to deeper uh, layers of soil and many other physical mechanisms. Uh, they also have some vegetation uh, death term that would be this, this one here at the proportional uh, at a constant rate M. And they also account for uh, lateral diffusion of both water and vegetation. Of course, the mimic, the, 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 the translation between uh, diffusion and, and random walk theories for the case of vegetation doesn't work so well. I want to make, uh, to, to clarify that in the case of vegetation, this diffusion accounts for dispersal when the patch is growing. There is no move, uh, active movement behind these models. So to explain a little bit more uh, how these models operate, I, I, I want you to, first of all, focus on this term that I said was accounting for conversion of water into biomass. So, this term, um, it's, it's very important to, to remark that it's nonlinear in the vegetation biomass. And the reason for that nonlinearity is because it accounts for the fact that when water is limited, when there is limitation of water, the presence of vegetation, for instance, this nice tree that you can see here, enhances the infiltration of more water into, into, into the soil. So it improves the conditions for water infiltration in a way that the presence of, of plants promotes more infiltration of water. And that's why this term here is non-quadratic because it accounts for this short range activation, uh, activation feedback that in, in ecological terms could be, it's called uh, facilitation interactions. Of course, the uh, increased infiltration of water into, into patches of, in patches of vegetation is going to create a special heterogeneities in the distribution of water. So if I'm infiltrating a lot of water, uh, basically this region is going to be water deprived. So we need a second mechanism that in this case is going to be diffusion. And if the diffusion of water is much faster than the dispersal of the vegetation, then these gradients in water availability are going to be smoothed out by diffusion. And these differences are going to transport water laterally to vegetation patches. And this long range inhibition feedback, I'm going to explain why this long range inhibition feedback is basically closing a feedback loop by which patches of vegetation enhance the infiltration of water. They also enhance the transport of water laterally through them, and therefore they eliminate water outside the patches. That's why there is long range inhibition, because this lateral diffusion is going to eliminate water outside the patches and it's going to inhibit the growth of vegetation there. So this is more or less Turing principle applied to vegetation, to water vegetation interactions. People were kind of, of happy because they had now a mechanism to explain the formation of these patterns. And they started asking cool questions, cool ecological questions to these, to these models. The first question that uh, they started thinking of was uh, how these models predict the vegetation biomass to behave as a function of, of rainfall, as a function of the availability of water. So if we look at how these models predict the mean vegetation biomass to behave as a function of water, and here I want to make it clear that by mean, I mean a spatial average. So basically I'm going to take my uh, regions and I'm going to integrate the amount of vegetation that I have and divide by the area. Uh, these models, unsurprisingly, I, I guess for all of us, predicted the negative correlation between water availability and vegetation biomass. So basically the more water I have, the more plants I will, I will have. But there is something deeper in these models. So if you remove this spatial average and now you look at the spatial distribution of plants, uh, these models predict that the shape of the pattern also correlates with the availability of water. So as water becomes more scarce in these systems, the distribution of water transitions from being uniform to being gap, labyrinthine, and finally forming these spots as, again, as we move across this uh, gradient in, in rainfall. More important than that, at some point when, we are in this, when the system reaches the spot pattern, these models predict that if uh, rainfall continues to decrease, the system will undergo an abrupt transition and will collapse uh, abruptly into a desert state. This kind of transition has very important implications from an ecological and conservational point of view, because uh, as you can see in this phase diagram, if the system, uh, for the system to recover vegetation again, because these abrupt transitions has uh, half an, an, an hysteresis loop, rainfall has to grow much more has to overcome this hysteresis loop before a perturbation takes us back to a vegetated state. 
So there are a lot of ecological implications that I'm happy to discuss further with you, with you afterwards. So this is kind of an, uh, an interesting story. We have a model to explain the patterns. We have a model to understand what are the consequences of the patterns, but there is a gap here. Uh, and the gap is that there is no direct, direct uh, empirical evidence that this scale-dependent feedback is responsible for patterns. It is true that these feedbacks are measured in the field. It is true that they have been quantified. It's true that they are there, but no one has been able to design an experiment or to design a field, uh, ex a field um, either a manipulative experiment or some data observation that connects this scale-dependent feedback with patterns in vegetation systems. And with this uh, observation in mind, when I started my PhD, we started asking whether this was the only way to get patterns. I mean, this is just a theoretical hypothesis. And, and then we, uh, supported by, by a, a huge body of literature that challenges the, the, the importance of uh, short range positive feedbacks to, to have these patterns, we started asking ourselves if it was possible to get patterns out of only negative feedbacks in this system. So what we found, and I am happy to give you more mathematical details of, of our models afterwards if you, if you wish, what we found is that even without these positive feedbacks, we still get the same sequence of patterns correlating with uh, water availability, but now the nature of the transition changes. And instead of having this abrupt transition with hysteresis, we have a smooth transition in which vegetation is lost gradual, gradually from, from, from the system. And of course, this has very important ecological implications. Discerning whether these transitions are going to be abrupt or, the, or whether they are going to be continuous is really important to control, manage, and, and to, 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 to manage these desertification processes and understand these ecosystems better, of course. So where we are at this point is we're in a point where we have these different theories that both of them predict the formation of these patterns. Both of them predict their correlation with water availability. This correlation is supported by empirical data. So we have data across gradients of rainfall in which we see that more arid regions develop these spot patterns and more humid regions develop these gap patterns. But we don't really know which mechanisms are uh, responsible for these patterns. And of course, there is one additional layer that is that very easily different systems could be driven by very different mechanisms. And there is no way for us to generalize as, as, as a whole this theory for transitions in drylands globally. That would be, I think, uh, very much too risky. So what we can learn, though, is that these patterns, it is true that they have the potential to be uh, early warning indicators for this the certification transitions. They are kind of re reliable. They are cheap to work with because we can get them, for instance, from Google Maps. but if we want to make predictions about this system, if we want to have models that have predictability power, we cannot be happy with models that only reproduce the pattern. We really need to understand these systems. We really need to work with uh, ecologists, with hydrologists to understand these water vegetation feedbacks and develop system specific models that make meaningful predictions. So uh, this is the direction that uh, my, my work, or our work in this, in this topic has taken. I'm going to very briefly give you some insights on how we are trying to, to develop this. Uh, so the first thing, of course, that we need to do if we want to develop system-specific uh, theories for these, uh, for these ecosystems is to know where these patterns are. And that's far from, from, from being a trivial question. I mean, Every year, people have, uh, find more and more examples of these self-organized uh, patterns. We really don't know how, how frequent they are in drylands, if they are um, except, uh, like um, exceptions or if they are uh, more frequent. So the first thing that we are trying to do is to identify regions in the world where we find these patterns. And to do that, we can use a lot of uh, computational tools. Computers are very good at identifying patterns. They are very good at identifying regularities. And I, I want to give you a very, very brief preliminary stuff of, of uh, preliminary results of the, of the things and the ideas that we have in mind. And this is work I'm developing with my former advisor, Corina Tornita, and an astrophysicist in, in Job Hopkins University, Brisbane Art. So basically, the tool that we want to develop is a, a, a computational pipeline to which you fit with an input image. For instance, here you have this pattern ecosystem that is uh, somewhere in, in, uh, in Zambia. And then you do a series of operations that, of course, involves taking it to Fourier space and manipulating the, in a way that you smooth it out, you remove filter. And at the end, you try to get a, sig a, 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 a power spectrum of that image that has uh, the, 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 that it's going to inform you 
about the existence of, of regularity, basically. So what you can see here in this plot is the power spectrum of, of this pattern, which is basically the, the, the image in the Fourier transform with a radial average, that is already telling us that about 10, 0 0.1 meters uh, to the power of minus one, we have some, some regularity. So the idea, and this is a very long-term ambition, is to be able to develop some tool that can run over larger libraries of images and return regions where potentially we could have these patterns. Of course, this is uh, far from being done and far from being uh, easy, it's, uh, but I think it's a very, very exciting uh, way, way to, to, to go. Of course, once we have these regions identified, then we can work system specifically. And the image that you have now in, in, in the screen is, is an image from Mozambique, from an ecosystem where we are currently working. And this is a, a, an ecosystem that for half of the year is, uh, it's, it's flawed, it's full of water, and for half of the year it's dry. So it has a wet season and a dry season. On top of that, the soil has a lot of clay. So there is soil dynamics involved here. When the soil dries, when the soil dries out, it uh, contracts and it breaks down. And when it's full of water, it expands and it creates some micro topography in the soil. So this is a very nice uh, system to study this water vegetation uh, feedbacks in the presence of complex uh, topography, which is, which is what we are doing. So once we have these patterns identified, we can again use a series of uh, computational tools to identify the spatial statistics of these systems. And the, the, the image that you have in the screen now is the same ecosystem as before, but now it's taking in the dry season. That's why now it's so brownish and before it was so, so green. But still, I think you can distinguish the different vegetation patches that we have here. So we can uh, use uh, computational tools, as I said, to identify the different vegetation patches in this image. Uh, we can run different geometrical operations. In this case, what you are seeing is a boronite tessellation of this pattern. And once we have this, uh, this tessellation constructed, we can uh, quantify the statistical properties of this, of this pattern. Uh, we run a series of, of measures here. Um, the one that I'm showing you is the spatial distribution, is, sorry, is the distribution of distances between nearest neighbors patches of vegetation. So the, ring cur the red curve that you have here is for the image, so for the pattern. And the black one with the green envelopes is for a random distribution of points that we construct out of the uh, number of patches that we have here. <clears throat> so as you see, this metrics is already telling us that there is a very strong regularity in the system. So there is a significant difference in the distance between vegetation patches as compared to the random case. And what we can do is fit our models with all these statistical properties of the pattern that we can obtain from the images. And in this way, we can fine tune these models to become more, more system specific. So again, uh, very uh, preliminary uh, results on, on this. Uh, what we can do, for instance, we can compare this transition between uh, the flat surface or the flat landscape and the topography, the surface with, with topography. And what you can see is that, uh, what we find is that in the case of these flat landscapes, the patterns follow the sequence that we saw before. This is the transition that we saw before. But now when we account for topography here, of course the, the patterns uh, change because this uh, micro topography is accumulating water in regions that are, um, uh, uh, so sorry, I, I, for, I forgot to explain this properly maybe. In, in this expansion and contraction of soils, at the end what we get is a, a, a topographic pattern that resembles a golf ball. So we have some small pools and some small terraces. And therefore, water is going to accumulate in the pools and it's going to persist longer during the dry season. And it will uh, create these small regions where uh, vegetation is going to grow. So basically, in this case, the vegetation is following the template of the topography very closely. That is, that is the idea. But in addition to, to the change in the pattern, we also have changes in the transition. So as you can see here, the transition is less abrupt. Rem uh, I want to, to remark that this is a logarithmic scale. So the, the, the jump in the transition is, is decreasing. And also the size of the hysteresis loop is smaller, which is basically indicating that in the presence of topography, it's easier to recover these ecosystems because the amount of rainfall that, uh, how much rainfall must, must increase before the system can recover vegetation is, is much smaller. 
So uh, this is a project that is still uh, ongoing. We, we really want to, at some point, uh, and we are working on it, on it now, we want to develop a model that couples this soil dynamics with the, with the vegetation dynamics. In, so far, the results that you see here assume that the soil uh, is, the topography is fixed. It's some kind of a, um, a fixed template over which vegetation and, and water interact with each other. And it is work that we are doing with Ruben Juanes, who is a, a civil engineer in MIT, and again with, with Corina Tarnita and, and with Juan Bonacella and Rogers. And just to, to wrap up this part, I told you I wanted to be a little bit more provocative about these, these patterns in the beginning. And, and something that I, I've been thinking since I started working here is about this uh, Turing stability uh, route for, for pattern formation and how general it is, it is in biology. So I've discussed patterns that uh, happen in the scales of kilometers. If we go down in scales, coral reefs have these kind of similar structures. Again, these gaps, these labyrinth labyrinths, and these spots in the scale of meters. If we go down and we are lucky enough to live in a tropical uh, region uh, or take some, some holidays there, tropical fishes also have these kind of patterns in their skin. And even more strikingly, and this is a paper I, I, I found um, a couple of years ago and I found as amazing, if we go to nanometric scales, there is a work on, on insect corneas that is also finding these same patterns at that, that scale. So here I'm covering 12 orders of magnitude in these patterns, and, and the shapes seems to be, seem to be quite uh, universal, and I want to say universal. Uh, so a, a question that uh, keeps in my mind and, and that we are trying to understand by comparing very different systems that form patterns is to which extent across all these scales, these interactions between uh, units are driving this same, this same pattern. So to which extent these, these mechanisms are scale independent? How is that nature is able to, across such a huge range of scales, end up forming the same sequence of patterns? And that's more a physicist point of view of, of this problem. So I think at this point, uh, ecologic, I mean, we, we all get a sense that ecological self-organization is, is interesting. These patterns are very, uh, very, very nice. But they have a problem, at least for someone that is uh, has a more quantitative training. And it is that, first of all, they occur on a very long time scale. So one of the reasons why do not, we don't have direct evidence of uh, scale-dependent feedbacks creating these patterns is because we need to measure them for hundreds of years, and that's kind of tricky. A second uh, reason is that they are very noisy. So it's really hard to disentangle competition from facilitation in the field and get clean results. And, and, and these experiments are not, are, not, are not so easy to do. So to get an idea of this uh, universality, again, to this uh, scale independent uh, pattern formation uh, mechanisms, when I moved to, to Princeton to, to start my postdoc, I started working on self-organization on a much, much smaller scale. So self-organization in microbial colonies. Uh, the, the reason to, to, to use microbes to study self-organization is because they are much more easy to deal with in the lab and self-organization uh, self occurs much faster. So we are, have access to more data in a, in, in a shorter time. So I'm going to discuss two examples of self-organization that actually are going to illustrate two different routes towards uh, multicellularity in, 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 in microbial communities. One is going to be uh, bacterial biofilms that represent a mean by which uh, organisms can create a multicellular colony by sticking together. So by not perfectly um, separating after cell division. And the second example is going to be uh, cell aggregation in, in slime modes. That is an example of uh, active aggregation uh, and multicellularity. So multicellularity achieved by actively aggregating. So why I'm saying that bacteria biofilms are such a good example for multicellularity? So if we look at the life cycle of biofilms, uh, we see that it all starts when some bacteria cells that are living freely in some environment in a planktonic state, they are, they are swimming here, they find a surface. When they find that surface, they attach to it, they lose their flagella, so they cannot swim anymore, and they start growing in a two-dimensional monolayer. As they continue to grow, they start growing also in 3D, 
they start secreting an extracellular matrix that here I'm representing by this uh, yellow, well, I'm not, sorry, this paper they're represented by this yellow envelope that basically sticks cells together and protects them to external uh, stresses, like for instance, antibiotics. The colony continue to grow, and it grows a, a much mature colony where now these cells start secreting a lot of molecules. They start coordinating their behaviors with each other, and they start behaving truly as a, as a collectivity rather than as a collection of, of, enti of, of entities and a collection of cells. Eventually, this biofilm is going to break, cells are going to disperse, and the whole thing is going to start again. So these cells, if we focus on this mature biofilm stage, they are attached to each other, they cannot move, and they are performing a lot of collective behaviors. So it is very important for them uh, to, the, the, the identity of the cells that surrounds them is very important for these collective behaviors to, to succeed and to be evolutionary stable. And this is well known, this is well known in the literature, but there is much less that we know about how that spatial structure starts. So what is happening in these early stages of biofilm development that is going to determine this spatial structure of the colony? And this is what I want to discuss with you. So uh, framing it in, in the questions that we had in the beginning, I want to discuss with you what causes these biofilm spatial structures and what are the consequences of this spatial structure. So to attach this question, <clears throat> We combine experiments and theory. So just to give you a very brief overview of the experimental setup that we used, uh, we use a Vibrio cholera uh, bacterium, which is uh, the, 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 it's, it's causing uh, cholera in humans. And we modified it genetically. And when, when I say we, I mean our co experimental collaborator, who is uh, Karin Adel, who used to be a postdoc at uh, Max Planck Institute of Terrestrial Microbiology. Now he's a professor at Dartmouth in the US. So he modified this uh, bacteria in a way that he was able to create strains that were highly adhesive and strains that were non-adhesive at all. So basically he was able to knock out the genes that are responsible for the secretion of this extracellular matrix that I mentioned before. And then out of these two levels of adhesiveness, he was uh, creating different strains, different genetic variants that were expressing blue fluorescent protein and red fluorescent proteins. So we were able to visually distinguish them. So we made mixes of highly adhesive cells and non-adhesive cells. And by this, uh, well, uh, the, the mixes that we did, and I, I want this to, to be clear, is that we didn't mix different levels of adhesiveness. So we mixed blue adhesive cells with red adhesive cells and blue non-adhesive cells with red non-adhesive cells. Um, if you're interested in the interaction between different levels of adhesiveness, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that later as well. It's, it's very interesting. So we inoculated these mixes in, in microfluidic chambers, which are experimental devices that uh, allow these cells to grow over surfaces in a very nice conditions. They have food that is provided through, through this external flow. And at the end of the experiment, what we got is these uh, spatial patterns that you see in your screen now, basically. So two dimensional patterns of red and blue cells uh, occupying uh, surfaces. So uh, we were able to play with the adhesiveness of the cells and, and with the density of, of, of the initial inoculum. And what we found is that for experimentally, for non-adhesive cells, the shape of the pattern does not depend on the, on the initial cell density. Whereas for adhesive cells, there is a strong correlation between initial density and the spatial structure of the, of the colony. So this is an experimental observation. Probably some of you have intuition to explain this result. But to really quantify it, what we did was to develop a, a mathematical model. And the model that uh, we developed was a lattice-based model, like for instance, could be the easy model, but with different updating rules for the state of each of the lattice uh, positions. So we were interested in isolating key mechanisms for this surface occupation process. And we came up with uh, three, mini, three, three key ingredients for this to happen. So the first one is, of course, reproduction. There is no way that these cells will expand if they don't divide. The second one is competition for space. So there will be scenarios in which cells are going to uh, be willing to, they are going to, to try to reproduce, for instance, the blue ones here in the middle, but all their neighborhoods are going to, to be occupied. In this case, what we assume is that depending on the adhesiveness of the cells, non-adhesive cells are going to be able to push their neighbors whereas adhesive cells are not going to be able to push and instead are going to be detached and relocated uh, in, the, in the neighborhood in, in different distances. And finally, 
we have the effect of this flow that is going through them in the microfluidic chamber that basically is going to be able to detach cells from some position of the, of the lattice and place them in a different, in a different uh, location. So with these ingredients, uh, we can run this model computationally in, the, in, in lattices. And what we observe is that, again, for non-adhesive cells, the shape of the pattern does not depend on the initial condition. So here, the big picture is for uh, uh, simulated patterns, and the small insets are just the experimental result that you saw, you saw before. And when we turn to high adhesive cells, we find the same correlation between cluster size and initial cell density. So basically, when we have fewer cells, the clusters are larger. The reason for that result intuitively is that they have more space available for them to, to grow, and therefore, they will colonize larger regions before they collide with a different group. But of course, this is just a visual comparison, and we want to be quantitative. We want to quantify these structures. And the metrics that we use to quantify it is uh, related to the correlation function uh, that from statistical physics. So basically, um, the correlation function is going to give us uh, the probability of having two lattice positions occupied by a cell of the same color, or two lattice positions in the same state, if you want, as a function of the distance between these two different lattice positions. So intuitively, then, if patterns have larger clusters, which would be this uh, green uh, frame here, the correlation function is going to decay more smoothly because the probability of having two states in the same two lattice sites with the same color is going to decay uh, more slowly. Whereas when clusters are smaller, this correlation function is going to be more sharp. And then based on this correlation function, we define the correlation length as the distance at which this function crosses zero for the first time. So now we have a metrics. We have a way of encapsulating the spatial information of these patterns in one number in a, in a, in a, in a, scalar, in a scalar metric. So what we can do is we can run this, uh, this spatial analysis to all our experimental replicates and to all our computational replicates and compare them quantitatively. And this is what you are seeing in the screen. So in the screen, you are seeing four different data set. The small points, the small dots are experimental data. The green one is for adhesive cells and the black one is for non-adhesive cells. And the larger symbols are the mean correlation length that we obtain out of uh, running our model for 10,000 times with the same initial density. So again, the green is for adhesive cells and the gray is for non-adhesive cells. So what you see here is that now our agreement is not only qualitative, but we also have a very good quantitative agreement, of course, after proper parameterization of the model. So what we can do now that we have the model properly tuned is to explore with it regions that were not accessible experimentally, at least in the first time, in the first term. So we could run a much broader range of initial densities and a much broader range of flow intensities that experimentally were not so easy to achieve and see what were the model predictions to determine whether experimentally it, is, it was worth the experimental effort. So basically, uh, we were able to establish a dialogue between experiments and theory to guide both, uh, both lines of work. So what we did for all this wide range of initial cell densities and flow intensities was to quantify the correlation length of both patterns, adhesive and non-adhesive cells, and calculate the difference between them. Okay? So whenever you see red, uh, you see red sorry, in this, in, this, in this plot, it means that adhesive cells were creating larger clusters than non-adhesive cells. And whenever you see blue, it's the opposite thing. So the red, red region, which was the one that we're, we were able to explore experimentally, gives this intuitive result that whenever I have fewer cells, uh, I have uh, cells have more space to colonize before finding another group, and therefore they grow larger clusters if they are not relocated by the flow. But we also find a region here for weak flows in which we find the opposite trend. So basically, non-adhesive cells are able to segregate in a space more than adhesive cell. And that, that's not an intuitive result. That's uh, pointing us towards uh, a complex uh, feedback between the environmental flow and bacterial traits that is determining the spatial structure of biofilms. So we are now trying to confirm this result experiment, of course, but it's not, it's not easy. And we are also working on developing a field theory for this uh, lattice model that will hopefully allow us to gain more theoretical insights. 
other directions of, of work that we are taking here, and this is work laid by, by two of the postdocs here in my group, Jesus Encinas and, and Vivian Dornelas, is to extend these lattice models based on statistical mechanics tools to account for different uh, cell secretions in, in lattices and for different, uh, for, for, for different cell secretions in lattice that establish different types of ecological interactions. So in these cells, um, the secretion of, of molecules to the external media may establish mutualistic interactions. For instance, the red-blue secretes molecules that feed, sorry, the red cells secrete molecules, secrete molecules that feed the blue cells, and the blue cells secrete molecules that feed the red cells. But we can also have antagonistic interactions. For instance, the red cells could be able to secrete molecules that kill their, their, the, other, the other cells in the, in the, in the biofilm. And the, another example is, for instance, cooperation. These cells can establish uh, cooperative interactions through cell secretion, which is very important to understand some of the processes that drive the evolution of complex forms of life, like, like, as, as we are, for instance. Uh, but of course, uh, in, in all this picture, uh, we are taking a very uh, simplified description of, of these systems. I told you, for instance, that the flow was just relocating cells probabilistically from one place to the lattice to the other. And that's something that we also want to make more realistic. So for instance, uh, something that we are doing, and this is part of Joao's uh, master's uh, project, is to implement in this type of models real descriptions of the flow. So here, what you see is this ecological dynamics acting on, on a turbulent flow. So we are implementing different uh, models for turbulence and seeing how this chaotic mixing is determining interactions between cells and the long-term evolution of these communities. And, <clears throat> and, and as I said, and with this, I, I, I want, I want to, to finish, this, um, this form of achieving multicellular communities uh, in sessile organism was only one of the routes to get multicellularity. The other one is, is, is active aggregation of cells. So uh, to, to explore how this, uh, this uh, multicellularity induced by cell aggregation works, we used uh, slime modes as, as a model organism. And, and the reason for, for these slime modes uh, to be such a good model organism to study this question is because uh, they have a life cycle that has both a unicellular and a multicellular phase. So for those of you that are not so familiar with what a slime mode is, slime modes are amoebae. They are single cells. They live in the soil. They feed on bacteria. And whenever they have uh, bacteria enough to feed, they are unicellular. They consume the bacteria, they divide, and they do all their life as single cells. But when they don't have food, they start triggering a collective behavior that will end up in the formation of a multicellular aggregate. So basically, in response to the lack of food, they start signaling with each other. They start coordinating with each other. And as you can see in this movie, they start eventually, now they are happy, they are alone, but now they start eventually migrating towards the same uh, position in, in location in the, in, the, in the space. There, they create a multicellular aggregate, they start a whole developmental program, and at the end, they, they culminate in the formation of this uh, freaking body. So because of this life cycle, slime modes have been used for a very long time as a mother organism to study the evolution of sociality, the evolution of multicellularity, and, and many other in evolutionary biology questions. But uh, in these few slides that, that I will show you next, I want to focus on this population of cells that you are seeing in the screen. These are cells that do not respond to the collective behavior. These are cells that stay solitary despite all their partners are involved in this collective process. These cells were overlooked for many years. For, uh, in fact, most of the experimental protocols to work with this organism were developed aiming to reduce them because they were thought to be noise. But no one was able to quantify whether they were truly noise or not. So to understand what are the role that these cells are playing in this evolution of, of the multicellularity, the first thing that we need to do is to count them. So we did a, a series of experiments in which we were counting the density of non-aggregated cells that you will allow me to call them loners, solitary cells, as a function of the cells that were plated in the system. So basically, we were putting in, in petri dishes, in a small uh, glass dishes, we were uh, inoculating different cell densities. We were allowing them to aggregate. And at the end, we were counting how many cells were not 
uh, responding to the collective behavior. So when you, when you look into that date, those data, what you see is that initially, when we have very few cells, aggregation doesn't start. And therefore, all cells remain solitary. However, when we go above some threshold, what we find is that the density of cells that don't respond to aggregation remains independent of how many cells we have. And of course, if we repeat this experiment for different strains, for different genetic variants of these of this, uh, slime modes, we find that then they saturate at different levels of non-aggregation. <clears throat> so this result is very interesting because it's already telling us that this is definitely not noise. There is some underlying pattern behind these, these non-aggregated cells. But on top of that, it's also revealing a very complex mechanism for the uh, partitioning of these cells into aggregated and non-aggregated cells. So if you intuitively think that cells are tossing a coin and deciding whether they will aggregate or not with some, sorry, with some probability, then we should expect the proportion of cells to be, so we should expect um, that it should be a proportion of cells that doesn't aggregate, right? Like 20%, 10%. But here we don't have that. We have a fixed density that is a different proportion depending on how many cells we have. So again, uh, that opens uh, important questions regarding the causes of this self-organized behavior and the consequences. So the whole, because I don't have much time, I'm just going to give you uh, an insight of how, the, how we propose that these cells decide not to aggregate and uh, how, they, how they recreate this experimental result. So what we propose is that these loners are indeed part of the collective behavior. So they are not two different behaviors, but they are the result of the collective behavior. And how do we propose that? We propose that they emerge because this aggregation process is quorum-based. It requires some minimum density for it to trigger, but it is also stochastic. So again, putting this into images, and this would be like a, an artistic recreation of our active random walk model, uh, we have a population of cells that initially are secreting chemical signs to the, to the medium. They are all identical. They don't have any difference in their state. And because they are sensing a high concentration of signal, they will eventually decide, some of them, and probabilistically, will decide to start aggregating. And as they start aggregating, they start creating regions in the space where the concentration of signals lows down. And cells that are stuck in those regions will not have quorum to commit to aggregation anymore, and they will remain solitary. So with, with this uh, proposed mechanism, what we find is that regardless of how many cells we played in the system, the density of cells that doesn't aggregate plateaus as predicted by the experimental result. Of course, where this plateau is going to, to happen depends on the parameterization of the model, depends on how much cells uh, signal, how sensitive they are, how fast they move, and on a lot of very different parameters. But what it is very interesting about this model is that despite we constructed it using random walks and random walk theory, we can work a mean field limit of this model that allow us to solve it analytically. And it allow us to find analytically as well, what is the underlying mechanism behind this uh, population partitioning behavior. So if you're interested in this mean field limit, I'm very happy to open you all the details uh, afterwards. But basically what we find is that it is the interaction between the internal time scale of the cells. So the rate at which they decide to aggregate and the velocity at which they move, what determines this, the existence of, of, this, of these loners. And just to finish, as I did with, a, with these Turing patterns, I told you that I was very uh, fascinated by how these different uh, rules operated at different scales in biology. And something that we are uh, working on now is on trying to understand whether this imperfect synchronization that we observe in slime modes also operates at larger time scales. And to do that, we are working with wild beast. Uh, wild beasts are uh, one, of these, um, uh, one of the most amazing examples of self-organization in biology. So they basically, through the year, they go through uh, seasonal migrations in the, in the Serengeti, and they basically move from north to south, uh, from the wet, uh, wet, season, the wet season to the dry season, trying to, to follow areas with good uh, forage uh, quality. Recent experimental, uh, recent field work has shown that, uh, well, it is, sorry, it, is, it is known that not all wild beasts migrate. So they are partial migrants, which means that some of the individuals do this migration and some don't. Uh, 
and recent work has shown that uh, the number of individuals that doesn't follow this migration does not depend on the density of individuals, that the, on the number of individuals within the population. So as you can see here in this panel A, basically the number of animals that don't follow the migration is pretty density independent, as we saw in the case of the loans. So what we are trying to do is to try to extend this slide mode approach to, 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 this, to this different system with, of course, different communication uh, interactions to see whether this imperfect synchronization is providing some ecological and evolutionary advantage to this uh, wild beast. And with this, I, I want to finish. I just want to finish by going back to the big picture, um, summarizing these whole stories by the way that we look at these self-organized patterns. Uh, we look at them as a way to, uh, to connect uh, processes that happen at the individual level, individual behaviors, with processes that happen at the, at the system level and have ecological and evolutionary implications. Of course, these individual behaviors may respond to interactions between individuals themselves, between individuals and the environment. They may trigger responses in, that we observe through different movements, through different uh, demogra demography, demographic processes. But what is really important about these patterns and what we are really looking at is that they allow us to integrate this uh, information from complex biological systems that is uh, coming from very different scales. And they are serving as kind of hub to connect all these different scales. So with this, I just want to thank all the people that have been involved in all this project, all these uh, collaborators and, and mentors. Of course, the funding agencies that uh, pay, pay the bills and, and thank you all for, for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ricardo, for the great talk. Um, super interesting stuff.